Uh, good morning. I think that all of you are enjoying the very hot summer days. So, okay. So today I'm going to talk about the particle physics, and uh, that is a study of the what is the ultimate constituent of matter. Also, I th think I hope you understand that that kind of study is very closely related to or almost equivalent to the exploring the what it what happened in the beginning of the, our universe. So we are starting a lecture, so I want to try to use that small toys that is called clicker, audience response system. So this is the questions. What do you measure in? Mathematics, physics, chemistry, computer science, or others? So mathematics plus one, physics plus two. Okay. Okay. Oh, mathematics four, physics three, and the computer science. Okay, good. Okay, this is the plan of this talk. So, first we're gonna I'm gonna talk about the what is the particle physics, and uh, what is the status of this particle physics. Then, what could be expected in near future. Then I think we still have time to discuss about why we want to study this kind of fundamental physics. Uh, it's a little bit related to the, uh, your visit to uh, Peace Memorial Park in, on Sunday. So second question. Have you heard of these names? Higgs boson, neutrinos, quarks, dark matters, dark energies. So press the button, please. OK. I got seven answers. OK. <laughs> hmm. OK, that's very nice. So most of them know the dark matters, or, or heard about the dark matter, the Higgs boson neutrinos. OK, dark energy is not popular yet. OK, that's great. So OK, let's start a very beginning. What is a ultimate constituent of matters. So that is a very long question. Even that, that Greece philosophers think about this. So it's uh, 600 years BC. So the man called Teres think of the, the matters good made of the waters. Or other think of the air or soil that's solid, or fires. Then other guy, Empedocles, he thought about the, the matter as a composition of this whole. And even surprising that the, the names, what we call the atoms, that idea, that is a ultimate constituent of matters. That idea was already there in, by the Democritus, famous Greece philosopher, at the BC 460s. So that was some thought in Greece, ancient Greece uh, histories. And uh, at the far east, in China, there was a similar thought. That is called Wu Xin. Uh, I don't pronounce the Chinese word, but, but that means the five elements. So there was a thought that uh, in, in China, the matter was cons consisted of the five elements. So together with the other thought in China, that the yin and yang, that is the shady side and, and the bright side. So together with that thought and this Wu Xin, that was imported to Japan in the around uh, six centuries. But in Japan, well, that concept is developed in unique ways. It's not uh, cons constituent matters. That's uh, developed as a kind of future telling. Then the man or person studying this Wu Xin is called the rather uh, future terror or prophets in Japan. And that is still 
still popular in some sense in modern Japan as a cartoon character or computer games. So if you look into the, your cell phone, you can find uh, some computer games. So one important point with this kind of the uh, history is that this is very old, uh, more than two, 200 years back. So at that time, even they thought about the, what is the matter made of, but they have no way to prove that. So that was technically impossible. So that's just concept or theory, but they don't have any way to prove their theories. So to develop this kind of concept in modern sense of the science, we have to wait or we have to jump to two, over 200 years. So in 17th or 19th century, so we have some idea. Then, uh, for example, starting the water. So that is made of molecules, H2O, dihydrogen monoxide. That's not toxic, okay? Then the, that H2O is made of atoms. That was around the early 20th centuries. At that time, in the early 20th centuries, there are concept of atoms. But at that, at that time, they already know that something called electrons is coming out from these atoms. Then the electrons, or negatively charged, but atoms is electronically neutral. So the one issue at the time was how this atom made up, That's because this is a neutral, then there's some idea, and there are some famous experiments by like Rutherford in 1911s. So what they did was prepare the polonium that emit so-called alpha particle that is actually a nuclear of the high, uh, helium atoms. They, they put that alpha particle into gold foil, then see what happened, how that alpha particle scattered by this gold atom. Oh, they observed that with the fluorescence screen here. That's a tabletop experiment. Then this is what happened uh, in the, their experiment. When impinged alpha particle onto the gold, most of them almost go straight. However, that small part of the alpha particle scattered in very large angles. So that means there was a very hard core inside the atoms. Then if alpha particle hit that core, that is scattered to the very large angle. That is a, this is a historical experiment which discovered the existence of a nucleus at the uh, 1911s. Actually, this, uh, this is famous as the Rutherford experiment, but actually the, this was performed by the, his students, uh, Marsden and Geiger. Those two are also will be uh, very famous ex uh, scientists. Then, after that, so we knew that inside atoms, that's what that called uh, a nucleus in there, and the electron circulating around. So, the next question is this, this nucleus. Is this an elementary particle, or they are still composite? So then there's another experiment. In 1960s, so this is a area view of the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. It's about uh, located at 50 kilometers south of San Francisco. What they did was the using the electrons onto hydrogen atoms. The difference is that they accelerate 
or give energy to electrons using this three kilometer long so-called accelerators, very large facilities. And uh, this was an experimental area. This is a very huge experimental room. So what they found in this experiment is that following. So they accelerate electrons and put that into the hydrogen. Again, most of the electron almost goes straight. However, that a part of the electrons, again, scatter to the very large angles. So that also means that there is a very hard materials inside the protons. It looks like this. At that time, that constituent inside the proton was called the proton, but we now call that as a quarks. So this is a discovery of quarks in 1960s, and they got a Nobel Prize for this experiment in 1990. Okay, then this is a, what we know about the constituents or materials uh, in 20s, and still this is correct. So starting with the water, it was made of the H2O molecular. Then molecular was made of the atoms. And atoms was nucleus and, and the electrons. And the nucleus, proton and neutron, this was made of the quarks. So now we think that that quark is an elementary particle. And the electrons are electro elementary particle around us. So then, next questions, how they interact? Because uh, only matter does not make this kind of materials. So we need, we need the interactions to make these materials, ourselves, or the desks, or stars. So that part, elementary particle has to interact some way. So then let me ask these questions. How many interactions we know so far? Two, four, six, eight, more than eight. Okay, oh, four. That's great. Yes, four. Then the, let me show some. That's called strong interactions. That is a interactions between quarks. And uh, the reason why I put the picture of the nuclear plant is that uh, the energy of the nuclear plant or nuclear fission is mostly due to come from this uh, in strong interactions. And this is the strongest interactions we know. Then the, I put the uh, strength of the strong interaction one. Then other point is that in current uh, theory of particle physics, the interaction is mediated by particle. So if there's an interaction, there is a particle, which we call the gauge bosons, to mediate, mediate that interaction. Then the, for the case of a strong interaction, we call that the gluons. Then the, the second one is electromagnetic. I think all of you are familiar with these interactions. And the strength is about 10 to minus 2 of these strong, uh, strong interactions. And this is mediated by the photons. And the third one, that we call weak interactions. That's weak. The strength is about uh, 10 to minus 13 of a strong interaction. And uh, its mediator is called W boson or Z boson. The reason why I put this picture for this weak interaction is that this is a picture of the supernova, remnant of super, supernova. It's a crab nebula. Even this very weak, but uh, 
we know that 99% of energy of the supernova was radiated, radiated by this weak interaction in the safe, safe shape of the neutrinos. So even that's weak, but this is, that affects very much on the phenomena in the universe. And uh, lastly, this is a gravitational interactions. So in the real life, gravitational interaction is very strong. However, this is because uh, gravitational interaction act between the masses. The reason why that gravitational interaction is very strong is that Earth or planet or sun, stars, that's a very heavy, a massive. That's, a, that's a why because the gravitational interaction is very strong. However, that interaction in between elementary particles, that is very, very weak too weak to measure. So strength is 10 to the minus 40s of strong interaction. So as an interaction between the elementary particles, we cannot measure the, the gravitational interaction. In that sense, the gravitational interaction is the most unknown part of the, of the particle physics. Okay, let me <clears throat> talk about how we investigate these very small things. I put one picture. Okay, I don't have a this clicker. So, how, any, how many of you see this? <laughs> this is a Japanese suite. The question is, how we can investigate how, what this, we, we call that a daifuku, that's what that thing made of. Of course, it is very soft, we can separate it by hand. But suppose that it's very hard and very small, and uh, we, can, we cannot separate it uh, by hand. So in that case, uh, probably some smart guy for example, uh, lecturers in this afternoon might think that uh, they could use the synchrotron radiation or X-ray or electron microscope to look into that. But we particle physicists don't do that. Just smash them, then see what happens. Of course, the, we have a reason, because uh, actually the protons, the elementary particle, was too small to see by the electron, by singleton radiations. Then we just smash them. Uh, then I smash them for you on the screen and smash them. That maybe happened. So before that, we see that for example, some black point here, but uh, we don't know what is black point. But if we, if we smash them, this black one's coming out. And even there's some sweet paste inside that has not seen. So actually, this is a very simple cartoon, cartoon but uh, Essentially, this is a, particle physics do this. Uh, smash some electro, um, elementary particle, then see what happens. Okay, you know, it's a Rutherford experiment. Just put the alpha particle onto gold, then see what happens. And the Stanford experiment impinge the very high energy electron onto hydrogen, then see what happens. But difference of the, these two experiments is the size of the, these facilities. The gold atoms, its size is about 10 to minus 10 meters. Then we can do it in the kind of the tabletop experiment. 
then the proton, its size is about 10 to minus 15 meters, very small. In order to investigate inside the proton, we need a larger facilities. So that is an essential difference of this experiment. So, what we're doing is that uh, just prepare the facility or machine to call the accelerator, then give the energy to that elementary particle, then smash them, then see what happens. Then, reason why we need a very large facility to inv investigate a small area. We have two reasons. One is that, according to the famous Einstein theories, E equal mc squares. That means that energy is equivalent to the mass. Then if we want to create some new particle, which is heavy and not discovered yet, we have the enough energy to create that unknown particles. For example, uh, you might know that the particle called Higgs bosons, I will talk to you later, that was discovered in 2012. The mass of that Higgs boson was 225 GeV. That's almost the same as the cesium atoms. The mass number of cesium atoms is uh, uh, 137. So that, in order to make that heavy particles, we need a very large facility and a very high energy interactions. Then the second reason is this. In order to look inside a very small area, we need some probes. Then that probes have to be a wavelength smaller than, oops, smaller than that areas. For example, if we want to the uh, microscope using the visible light, the wavelength of the visible light is about uh, one micrometers. So we cannot see the area less than one micrometer using this uh, visible light microscope. Then, there, then we need, uh, for example, an uh, electron microscope. Then, the, according to the quantum mechanics, the matter's particle has a, a wave nature with a wavelength of lambda equal h divided, divided by its momentum. That is called Dubroy wavelengths. So, this formula telling us that if we want a small wavelength, we need a large momentum, large energies. That's the reason why we have to construct a very large facility to provide the large energy into the particle, then smash them. So that's the reason why we need a large uh, machine called accelerator. Then the accelerator we need that because uh, we, ha we want to explore or investigate this phenomena in, in the laboratories. But the other questions, is there any this interaction in the nature? If this kind of interaction happened in the nature, we don't have to construct these large facilities or large machines. Unfortunately, there's no area in, in our universe at this moment, but there was the area in, the, in our universe. As you know, our universe was created or born long time ago with a phenomena called Big Bang. After that, our universe is keep expanding and reach this size, and we are here now. So, could you try that again? 
I, I don't know if it's work or not. <laughs> anyway, press buttons. How old is our universe? About uh, 7,500 7, years, 1 million years, 4.6 billion years, 30.8 billion years. Whoa. Okay. Okay, see, this story works. Oh, yes, it works. Fine. Yes, 38 billion years. That's it. That is uh, our answers. So, well, uh, 4.6 billion years, that is the uh, age of Sun or Earth. Uh, 7,500 years. Uh, According to the Bible, the <laughs> age of the, our universe should be something like this. Okay, this is the expansion of the very beginning of our universe. So, this is the beginning of the universe, then we have uh, 30.8 billion years, then there are our accelerators, accelerator experiment try to recreate the events or what happened around here. So in that sense, our current facility, the largest accelerator, recreated the phenomena that happened in the 10 to minus 10 seconds after the beginning of the universe here. Then what you're trying now is go beyond that time and how much we can reach to the uh, beginning of the universe. That is what we are doing. Then, then the, the other as aspect. So we know that there are the four interactions at this moment here. But we think that at the very beginning of the universe, interaction may be one only one interactions. That was separated into four along with the, this evolution of our universe. So that is a hypothesis. So what we want to know is that that is really true or not. That is another aspect of the particle physics. So anyway, uh, so what we're doing as by the particle physics is investigating the history of our universe, how our universe began. So, but there's another way to look into the past of our universe. Look into the sky. You know, the sun we see now is a sun of 8.3 minutes ago because uh, it takes a 3.3 minutes by the light. So then the closest stars, except for sun, it takes uh, three point years by light. So that means the this star we are looking at now is a star of three point years ago. In that sense, the most distant galaxy we see now is about 13 billion years ago. But we still have a way to go because the uh, Big Bang is about 30.9 billion, year, billion years ago. So this picture summarizes how we look into the beginning of the universe. First, we must think that just go to the space, but uh, it's not enough to look in, into the past of our universe. Uh, you may know the spacecraft called Voyagers, that was launched by the United States uh, 20 or 30 years ago. That recently that's passed through the boundary of, of our planet, uh, solar systems. So in a sense of time, it's too close to look into the past of the uh, our, our universe. Then 
the other method is look into the sky. Yes, yes, that works very well. So there's an observatory. We have a one in the Higashi Hiroshima Observatory here. So you visit tomorrow. Then the, there's a famous Hubble telescope in the space. And recently, there was a news that the gravitational waves was observed two years ago. That was a new eye to look into the sky. So, but in addition this, to this observatory, we can build the large scale accelerator, then recreate the phenomena that happened at the very beginning of the universe. So that is what we are doing. So interestingly that uh, we want to see the ultimate constituent of matters. In other words, looking into the very, very small area of the matters. But that was equivalent to the looking into the beginning of the universe. That is the largest structure around us. So that's very interesting. Look into the small. That means exploring the how our universe, largest structure around us, began. OK, this is a, our st status in the particle physics. So in that almost 2,000 year, many people working on that. Then the, we know this level, the, what our matter is made of. So it's a matter particle called quarks and the leptons. The lepton is the, in, include the electrons, muons, a tau lepton, something. Then the, what they call gauge boson that mediate interactions, gluons, hotons, and so-called weak bosons. And there's another particles, what they call Higgs bosons. So let me talk about this Higgs bosons. This is a status of the verification of the standard model of particle physics until 2011. So, well, it takes a very long time to explain how we verify the standard model, but let me show this way. The picture of the persons who got the Nobel Prize for this study of the standard model, this gentleman. So, however, there is some missing part here. That means that this part is not well verified in the, in the, in the standard model. That is related to the Higgs bosons. That is status in 2011. Then, Higgs boson, that was a long-standing issue for the particle physics. Higgs boson is a particle which gives a mass to elementary particles. That could sound very strange. Many people think that mass is a given nature of the particle. However, according to current standard model of particle physics. Mass is not a natural future of the particle. All particle, elementary particle, were massless, naturally. Then somehow, after it's born, that get mass by the Higgs boson, or what you call Higgs, Higgs mechanism. That was proposed in almost 50 years ago. Then the verification of this Higgs mechanism, also that Higgs mechanism uh, need a particle called Higgs boson. The discovery of the Higgs bo boson is a very important issue of the particle physics, physics for over 50 years. So, 
let me talk about that history that what now we call Higgs mechanism. That was based on, based on the one theory proposed by the Professor Nambu. He was born in Japan and later he became a US citizen. He proposed the idea, basic idea, in 1961, the year I was born. Then three years later, a gentleman called Mr. Hicks published this paper. Then he described, now we call it Hicks mechanism. That was uh, August of 1964. However, that two months before that Hicks paper, there was a very similar paper published by the Engelert Bro, June 1964. And also two months after Hicks paper, another paper was published. That's very similar. It's October 64. So at the time of the discovery of the Higgs boson, uh, 2012, we are think, think of that. Of course, uh, that deserved the Nobel Prize. But uh, who won the Nobel Prize? That was um, <laughs> some rumor, then the, the, some, some issue at the time for us. So, and this is a most complicated picture in this lecture. So, uh, what the Higgs mechanism? So, at the very beginning of the, of the universe, our universe is very hot. And all particles are massless and the traveling speed of light. But at the, at the time, after the beginning of the universe, temperature is getting <coughs> down, and uh, the f something, events, called the phase transition happened all over the universe. Then the universe was filled with a with fixed field, or more pre precisely speaking, in the condensed to the vacuum. Then, because of fixed field filled with vacuum, the particle was get mass, got mass via the interaction between that particle and the fixed field. So, very roughly speaking, because the universe is filled with a fixed field, so the particle could feel uh, friction from that fixed field. And that friction, we observe that mass of the fixed boson, very roughly speaking. Then after that, universe keep expanding and come to now. So because, uh, because we live in this fixed field, universe filled by the fixed field, so we did not rec recognize the, our universe the field of the fixed field then uh, it takes uh, 2,000 years to find that. Then, how we can verify that theory? The straightforward way is this called the Higgs boson. That was predicted by this Higgs mechanism. To do that, then just smash proton again. Then create the Higgs boson. But that needs a very large machine to call, which is called the Large Hadron Collider, LHC. That was located in the uh, Switzerland, France. That very big machine, its circumference is about 27 kilometers. Then that's much proton proton with the energy of 7 TeV and 7 TeV. TeV is a tera electron volt. Oh, by the way, it's continuing the experiment. Now its energy is 13 TeV. So it's upgraded. But at the time of the 2011, 2012, the energy was 7 TeV and 7 TeV. So you can see how big it, this is. That's a, you see the lake. And uh, you see the airport over there. So that's a very big facility. So this is 
picture showed how they accumulate the data of the fixed bosons. You see, data is accumulating, then the, there is a bump around here, getting clearer and clearer. So the horizontal axis is a mass reconstructed reconstruct by the experiment. So that small bump over here shows the existence of the Higgs bosons. Let me show again. So by the accumulate, accumulating the data, there's no bump here but getting clear and clear, and we will finally see some signal of the six boson, Higgs boson like this. So this data was published in 1912, and uh, we see that we, we recognize that the discovery of the Higgs bosons. Then, uh, Nobel Prize was finally awarded to these two gentlemen, uh, Engret and Hicks. Oh, because the, the paper was written by Engret at Bro. However, that the Professor Bro passed away before this discovered Hicks boson. So Nobel Prize awarded to, to these gentlemen, and uh, Francis Braut and Peter Hicks. So then the, this is the status of the verification of the standard model at 2012. So Higgs boson discovered here, and we put the two pictures here. Oh, by the way, there's another Nobel Prize in Japanese guys for the neutrino experiment. OK. So. By the discovery of the Higgs boson, that was the last missing piece of the standard model. Then the question is, the particle physics complete it or not? The answer is no. This is a ratio of the energy density of our universe. You see that matters that includes everything around us, <coughs> planets, stars, galaxies. But that matter is only 5% of our universe. The remaining 90%, 27% is a matter called dark matter, and 68% uh, <coughs> is what we call that dark energies. So that means the Standard model was very successful. However, that described only 5% of our universe. I showed how the dark matter discovered. That dark matter was rec recognized via the uh, observation of the motion of the planet, the stars. So this plot showed the velocity of the stars rotating around the galaxy. That is observed in Andromeda. Then the red car is a calculation. Calculated velocity based on the, this visible stars. However, that the white one is measured. There's a big discrepancy between the measured velocity and calculated velocities. So, in order to fill the gaps measured and measured, uh, calculated, we have to assume that there is a mass around here. We have to assume something not visible but has mass. That is called dark matters. So this is the evidence of dark matters. Then the other things, dark energies. So some guys, astronomers, observed the expansion of the universe using the supernovas. 
that happened in the uh, 1990s, what they observe is that the speed of this expansion is increasing here. So, so there's a big increase of the expansion, and the speed of in increase is almost constant. However, that recently, that speed of expansion is increasing, or expansion is accelerating. Like this. So, in order to explain that acceleration of the expansion of the universe, we have to assume some kind of energy to make this happen. Then, calculate the amount of energy according to this rate of expansion. What we found, what they found is that 68% of our universe is filled with this energy that is called dark energies. What is that dark energy? We have no idea. We have just assumed we need some kind of energy to explain this phenomenon. Then, the other questions. You might know the antiparticle or antimatters. If there's an electron, there's an antimatter, antiparticle of electron. That is called positrons. That matter and antimatter, or particle and antiparticle, anti that is very similar. That means at the very beginning of the, our universe, same number of the particle and antiparticle must exist. However, our current universe only dominated by particles. There's no antiparticle in nature. So that means in the evolution of the universe, sometimes antiparticle must be disappeared somehow. How does this happen? We don't know. That's a great mystery. Of course, the, just the experimental verification that particle and the antiparticle, there are small difference between them, not exactly the same. And these two gentlemen, uh, Dr. Professor Kobayashi and Maskawa, they have some theory to explain the difference between particle and, and, and antiparticles. But their theory is not, not sufficient to explain the missing antiparticle in the universe. So that reason is still missing. So we have many questions. What is dark matter? What is dark energy? Why did the antiparticle disappear? And uh, eventually, if we want to go beyond that question, so th there is an ultimate question. How did our universe begin? We do not add. And also, that question created more fundamental questions. I repeat the saying that universe, our universe, but is it really universe? Universe, maybe one of, maybe, one of many, that question. Universe or March birth. There's a possibility that there's many, many universe outside of our universe. So our universe may be one of them. That sounds interesting, but I have no idea how we can verify that. <laughs> so anyway, we have to go beyond the standard model. Of course, the, the, the LSC that find the uh, Higgs boson, that continue the experiment. However, there's one difficulty, difficulties. So the LSC smash proton and protons. And the proton is not uh, elementary particles. Proton consists of three quarks inside. Then if we smash two protons, that many events happen. Or 
interaction between two protons are very complicated, just like a smash on these two daifuku. It's very complicated, and it's very hard to see what happened in the elementary process. Then, one idea of the new facility is that smashed elementary particles, electron, and its, un its antiparticle positrons. So there is a plan to build a new machine, new accelerator, that smashes electrons and positrons. That is called International Linear Colliders. That is a global project. We are still a uh, planning process. However, that um, we, the scientists, participate in this project, want to build one in Japan, in the northern part of Japan, the Tohoku area. So this is a still a uh, stage of the planning and the de designing. So you know, in order to make it happen, the study of physics, feasibility is very important. And the uh, technical design of this uh, large scale machine is very important. Then you know, in addition to that, the public understanding of this large scale project is also very important. So in you know, order to do this, the outreach activity is also very important. So as a part of this effort, we did something like this. So this is a collaboration of the cartoon of the, the Sandio, and uh, you may know the Hello Kitty. <laughs> and uh, science times Hello Kitty, we, we created that uh, good. That is a part of our effort for the public outreach to, uh, to get understanding of this large scale project. This is very important because uh, finally this is supported by, we, we, in order to make this happen, we need a very strong support for the taxpayer and the younger generations. Okay, uh, in the remaining times, let me a little bit talk about the, is the why we search for and investigate this fundamental science of particle physics. So this is a question for you. The fundamental science, is it useful? How do you think? Not at all. Useful, even harmful. <laughs> OK. Yes, you are very supportive. <laughs> yes. Then, let me think of this. Why we want to investigate this fundamental science? Let me show two things, curiosity, spin off, and what else. So curiosity, there's many books in the bookstore and the library. So this is some uh, example of some book. Then the, why this books is available in the bookstore. That is because uh, people buy this, right? So that the reason, who, the reason that this is commercially available is that the people buy this book. That means there are many people, not not the scientists, many public people are interested in, in this uh, fundamental science. That's the reason why. Or I think that this kind of thing, curiosity, is a big difference between mankind and the other animals. So this is a very reason that why we came to this kind of civilization cultures. So recently, I found a very interesting TED talk. So this gentleman said that necessity is not always the mother of the inventions. Of course, you know that necessity is the mother of the inventions. However, it's not always. Having fun is sometimes lead to the very new inventions. In this TED talk, he shows some example of programmable machines, the computers. 
but uh, before the invention of the computers, there's no, no uh, way to create uh, what we call the computers. But the idea of the programmer machine exists long before the invention of the computers. Do you think, what do you think it, it was? That was a music box. Music box, we put a cylinder, then the program the music onto that cylinder as a pattern or pin. So the idea of program survives long time before the invention of the com computers. So it's not a necessity. Why we wanted the music box? It's just for fun. Then that fun eventually lead to the invention of the new things. So that was, this is what he said in his, his talk. If you are looking, interested, so take a look at his talk. So, however that uh, we have to think of the, our theory, particle physics, were really useful or not. This is some story. Long time ago, the Faraday demonstrated their electric, electric magnetism to the public. Then the, one of the audience asked that, what good of this phenomenon? Then the answer of the Faraday was, how do you know the future of the newborn babies? Then the, we know that this electromagnetism is around us. We cannot live even one day without this electromagnetism. So, but 150 years ago, nobody knows how useful it was, how useful the uh, Maxwell equation was. Uh, by the way, this story is probably the fiction. Okay. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, electromagnetism, quantum mechanics, relativity, those are the state of art, most advanced particle physics 100 years ago. But now we are living with that. For example, uh, global position system, that is based on electromagnetism, and the relativity is very important for this global positioning systems. And uh, this example is an accelerator. Accelerator is invented as a tool for the particle physics, nuclear physics. But now it's most popular in the hospitals, in the cancer treatments. And uh, the other example is a World Wide Web HTML language. That was invented to share the data of the particle physics around the world. That was invented by this gentleman, Tim Bernard-Lee at CERN, and now that changed our world very much. So some of this uh, fact that the world's first website was created in the CERN. CERN is the uh, laboratory which discovered the Higgs boson. Then the first website in the US was also in the elementary particle laboratories that are Stanford. And the first website in Japan also set up at the particle physics laboratory in the Tsukuba, in the northern part of Japan, and not, not in Tokyo. So we don't know the theory of the particle physics is useful or not at this moment, but the technique set of our technique is useful for the, our life. So, go say, you know, the car company made this uh, racing car. Why they do this? Because the uh, state of our technology will be fed back to the commercial cars. Then uh, we're gonna make uh, this kind of state of, state of our accelerator. Then that technique was applied to this commercial accelerator in the hospital. So technique is very useful. The... 
However, that, uh, I think that one of the most important points of this particle physics or fundamental science is investment of the futures. So one of the most important po points that the younger generation see that interest in this fundamental science. Then in the future, they will work on or they will support that kind of technologies. That is one of the most important part of this fundamental science. Okay, finally, let me talk a little bit about the contribution of peace of this fund fundamental science. This is an address of the professor of, of the University of Tokyo, uh, Hitoshi Murayama, our colleague. In his address in the UN, United Nations, he said, uh, for example, certain people from friendly or warring nation come to sand and build an amazing scientific instrument. That means the for example, the machine to which discovered the Higgs boson, that's a very large machine. And the detector itself is very huge. So thousands of people are working together, together to make that, construct that large scale accelerator and the detector to explore the beginning of the universe. And if we look into the, their mother country, of the southern people. They are not always friendly. How about that, uh, that for the purpose of this uh, uh, fundamental science, they work together. This is a one way that fundamental science contribute to the world peace, I think. Of course, uh, you know, our world is very complicated. It's not so simple. However, this is a, I think this is one way that fund fundamental science contribute to the world peace. And of course, uh, we shouldn't forget this as aspect. So we are visiting the Peace Mem Memorial Park, so the day after tomorrow. And uh, this is the picture I took from the, the visit of, of the uh, Barack Obama to the Peace Memorial Park in Hiroshima. And, uh, and this is a one word from this speech at the, at the Hiroshima. Uh, the scientific revolution that led to the split in the, in the atom require a moral revolution as well. So again, that uh, word is not so simple. Uh, for example, there's one uh, fact that neg one negotiation, uh, nuclear weapon ban treaty began last year in the United Nations. And that the vote, the vote for the final draft of the treaty took place last month. However, that Japan did not participate in that vote. All nations or the nuclear weapon state and Japan did not vote. So that's a re real world. It's not so simple. But I think that uh, uh, your visit to Peace Memorial Park is a good chance to think of those issues. Okay. Okay. Uh, the last questions. I will be visiting the Novosibirsk next month, BINP. So, September 18 to 21. So my question. Weather is it still hot, <laughs> good weather, or it's already cold. <laughs> this question to the, our Russian friends. Please press the button. <laughs> oh, <laughs> what should I wear? <laughs> okay, that's that is for my lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs>